Have you ever had a moment of listening into a Sunday school lesson and it appears that Jesus seems to be the answer and the acceptable answer to every single question? And that no matter where the kids turn to in the Bible, the story always somehow seems to point to and end up with talking about Jesus. Or maybe you've sat in church for a while and you've heard sermon after sermon and you might be wondering to yourself, how is it that these preachers manage to get to talking about Jesus no matter where we're reading in the Bible? Maybe you have an experience of sharing your burdens with a Christian friend. And maybe you're wondering, how is it that they managed to take every burden and make a beeline for Jesus. If you haven't noticed, well, maybe that's a little bit awkward and maybe it's time to start noticing. On the surface, you might ask, can Jesus really be the savior of every single story? Can Christ be the comeback to every single crisis? And can Jesus really be the goal and the game of every page in the Bible and of your life and of my life? Well, the answer unashamedly is yes. Not only can he be, but I'd like to show that he is. The first thing I want to get across in this training is that the goal of the scriptures beginning to end is to testify about Jesus, all of scripture beginning to end, is about Jesus himself. In a conversation with some of the religious leaders of Jesus' day, uh, these religious leaders called Pharisees who are steeped in the study of Scripture, Jesus says to them, you study the Scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. But these very Scriptures testify about me. Jesus is making the point that the Scriptures in themselves testify to him and point to him. All of the Bible's narrative, in fact, all of history and all of creation culminates and points to Jesus because he is the one through whom, by whom and for whom God has made everything and God sustains everything through him. So, yes, everything is about Jesus and especially for those of us who are called by his name, those who believe in him and are called Christians, certainly all the more everything is truly about Jesus for us. And I want to give you two quick examples of where we see this at play, that all of Scripture, in fact, testifies to Jesus. The first story I'd like to share with you is found in Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 35. It's often uh, labeled in our Bibles, on the road to Emmaus. And this situation and this incident happens immediately after the resurrection. So here in Luke 24, verse 13 onwards, read with me. Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They're talking with each other about everything that had just happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast, one of them named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What's more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women asked, amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they'd seen a vision of angels and that he was alive. And some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, and they did not see Jesus. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. Did you catch what Jesus said? about himself in relation to the scriptures. He said to them, how foolish you are and slow to believe 
all that the prophets had spoken. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then the comment the author Luke provides is, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. The law, the prophets, the Psalms, even all of the Old Testament points to Jesus. I was on a Zoom call just the other day with a church person, a fairly new believer, I would say, and we were discussing the book of Leviticus. And this person, good on him, uh, started reading the Bible from the beginning and was up to Leviticus. And this person asked this brilliant question and he says, what are all of these sacrifices and rules and descriptions in Leviticus all about? And they themselves had this moment of clarity where it tweaked and the penny dropped. And this person himself said, hey, hang on. Is it all meant to point to Jesus and what he would do when he would come later on? I said, yes, spot on. All of scripture is preparing us to encounter this person of Jesus to see the good news in every page. I want to give you a second example of how this happens. And this happens with an Ethiopian man who is traveling through the desert road in Acts chapter 8. And the same pattern plays out again. Philip the evangelist is busy sharing the gospel with different people. And we pick up the story in Acts chapter 8 and verse 26 to 34. Well, Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 34. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south of the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went, and now there was an Ethiopian, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of his entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian replied, how can I understand unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that the Ethiopian was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before his shearer, he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For life, his life is taken away from the earth. The Ethiopian asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does this prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And Philip began to speak and started with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. So you see, even in this situation, all of scriptures, the prophets pointing to Jesus himself. And Philip explains the good news based on this Old Testament prophecy by the prophet Isaiah. And Philip explains to the Ethiopian, this part of scripture too is pointing to Jesus and telling us about Jesus. The Ethiopian instinctively knew to ask, who is this about? And Philip, filled with the Spirit, instinctively now knows to say, this is about Jesus. So that's the first thing we've got to wrap our heads around in this training around gospel fluency, is that all of Scripture, beginning to end, is about Jesus, about the good news. But, you know, it's not enough for us to simply know that every part of the Bible and all of its elements are about the gospel and about Jesus. We've got to be able to see it for ourselves. We've got to be able to apply it for ourselves and to speak it to one another, all with the Holy Spirit's help. We call this gospel fluency. Now, like this term suggests, gospel fluency implies knowing the language of the gospel and being able to speak it and hear it and understand and comprehend it confidently, fluently, as you would with the language. So the second thing I want to get across today is that the goal of gospel fluency is to grow up into Jesus in all things and become mature by speaking the gospel. We read in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 
to 15. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is, Christ. The goal of our growth and the goal of our speaking is growing up into Jesus. That is what the goal of the body of Christ, the church, is. Our goal, our destination, is Jesus and maturity in Him. And the way we do that and get there is we speak the truth in love. Now, this truth is not just some random idea or some philosophy or a concept or just the opposite of lies. This truth that Paul talks about in Ephesians is a person, and this truth that we speak in love is Jesus, the good news of Jesus. So speaking Jesus, we become like Jesus. It's like when you magnetize a piece of metal, it becomes magnetic. Or when you tenderize a piece of meat, it becomes tender. When you gospelize yourself, and we gospelize one another, we become like the one who the gospel is all about. You see, the way we change and are transformed is not by sheer willpower of following rules of don't do this and do this, but the way we change is by hearing, by speaking and believing the gospel, of repenting of old ways of thinking and behaving and living, and being transformed by the renewing of our mind according to the truth that is in Christ. Finally, I'd love to show you a time in the early church when the gospel is still spreading um, and it's in its early days where two Christian leaders uh, were in conflict about something. And one of the Christian leaders had to confront the other Christian leader over this difficult issue. And Paul, who is an apostle, in his letter to the church in Galatia, in chapter 2, you can read about this, recalls an incident with his fellow apostle and fellow leader, Peter. And both of these men are Jews. Both of them are saved and called by Jesus. Both of them with their own particular backgrounds and issues and insecurities. And Peter and Paul are both in a city called Antioch. Now, Antioch is the city where... Uh, we have the first non-Jewish background church. We read about this in Acts chapter 11. So the church in Antioch is full of believers in Jesus who are not from Jewish backgrounds. And almost certainly like us Gentiles, who are mostly us who are watching today. Just one chapter ago in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 10, Peter has this vision from God that he is told he is not to consider anyone unclean or unworthy who God makes clean and worthy through Jesus Christ. So that's the backstory. Here we have Peter and Paul in Antioch. And Peter is happy to mingle with the new converts who are not from a Jewish background. He's happy to sit with them. He's happy to eat with them and fellowship with them like equal brothers and sisters in Christ. Now keep in mind, in Judaism, which was what Peter uh, formerly belonged to, you didn't eat with people who are not exactly like you, meaning you don't eat with non-Jews. Now keep in mind as well that one of the main accusations made about Jesus was that he eats with sinners, he eats with tax collectors, he eats with publicans or pub owners. And so Peter here is taking a leaf from Jesus and eating with these Gentile believers, those who are not from Jewish backgrounds, until some believers with Jewish origins arrive at this church in Antioch. Have you ever been in a family gathering or you're visiting your parents or you're visiting family members and you suddenly seem to revert back to the old way of behaving when you were a child in your parents' household or in the old way of behaving with your siblings and you don't notice it but someone else does and they have to talk to you about it afterwards. It's a bit like 
what's going on in this situation. Peter is reverting. The moment the Jewish background believers arrive, Peter stops eating with the Christians who don't have a Jewish background. And Paul notices this. So now we're going to play really quickly. Uh, who's going to be a millionaire? What's Paul going to say? Option A, Peter, you do you. Option B, Peter, stop it. Cut it out. Option C, Peter, you shouldn't be eating in large groups during isolation anyway. Or option D, something else altogether. Well, I'm waiting for your best answer right now in the chat function or the comments. Well, most of you got it right. It's option D. Paul doesn't say to Peter, Peter, you do you. Do what you're comfortable doing. He doesn't say, Peter, stop it. You're behaving badly. Cut it out. He also doesn't talk about isolation back then. But what Paul does is he preaches the gospel to Peter in such a way that drills right down to the core of Peter's issue. And he pours in the love and the grace and the mercy and the correction of God through Jesus into that space, right into the heart of Peter's issue. Before I look at Paul's response and Peter's issue and why Paul responds the way he does, let's run a quick diagnosis. You've heard the story. Can you write in the chat function what you think Peter's issue actually is? I'm going to take some time and wait and let you do that. Well, welcome back. In this incident, we're going to see how one of Peter's insecurities plays out in his behavior and how Paul masterfully speaks the gospel of Jesus to his brother in Christ. Paul says to Peter, and I'm paraphrasing here, Peter, we have been freed from that way of living. In fact, we have died to that way of living. No one is made right with God by keeping the law about cleanliness or whether they're circumcised or uncircumcised. We've been freed from that way of approaching God through the death of Jesus. We have died to that law-based approach by dying with Christ, by being united with Christ in his crucifixion and death. And the life we live here now, Peter, we live through the same Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Have you figured out, even through Paul's response, what Peter's problem was? Peter wanted to be seen to be doing the right thing. And in this moment, he wanted to be seen to be doing the right thing in the eyes of his countrymen rather than in the eyes of God. Peter was seeking the approval of man. He feared the rejection of people. Peter is seeking the approval of people who are just like him by distancing himself from those who were not like him, but who God had saved through Jesus nonetheless. And do you see Paul in his approach to Peter, the way he speaks the gospel straight to the issue, right to the heart, saying, Peter, why live like that? Why do you need the approval of these people when you belong to Christ? who gave himself for you and who loves you when you belong to him and you have his approval and belonging with him. Why would you trade that for that? What approval and belonging can attempting to please these people prob probably give you that Jesus hasn't already given you? If you had to put all of that in a blender. Paul is saying to Peter, God is love and he's shown you this love by letting go of his own son to take hold of you. And now you belong to him and you have his approval in Christ. You don't need to behave like that. You have God's approval. You see, each situation that we find ourselves in in everyday life of sin, entanglement, of enticement, of temptation, of strange behaviors. Uh, God doesn't say to us, stop it, fix it, just change it. 
just willpower your way through it. Or he doesn't at the same time also say, just carry on as you were because it's all covered by grace. No, actually God wants us to be able to speak and apply the gospel into every single situation in the particular way that it fits into that situation. So that the gospel and the grace of the gospel gets to the heart of the problem. And how the grace is there for us in the substitutionary life, death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what we're going to spend some time in our breakout rooms practicing, or breakout groups practicing, over the next few minutes. Uh, so please join me in that space if you're on a Zoom call. Amen.